It was 4.40 p.m. on Friday, 6th of October, 1972. Wayne Grant, a senior journalist at Melbourne's The Sun newspaper, was preparing for his weekend when his phone rang. A man's voice ominously spoke. I'll say this only once. I've kidnapped the pupils and teacher from Faraday State School. The anonymous caller said he left a ransom note on the desk in the classroom. He demanded $1 million or he would kill the children and their teacher. Then he hung up. Faraday State School was a humble one-teacher primary school in the tiny rural town of Faraday, located in the state of Victoria in Australia, 116 kilometers northwest of Melbourne and 40 kilometers south of Bendigo, with a population of just 50 people. The town's weatherboard cottages were scattered across endless rolling landscapes. The schoolhouse itself was a single granite building that was constructed in 1869 and served as the educational center for just 10 students. 20-year-old Mary Gibbs, a recent graduate from Bendigo Teachers Training College, was the only teacher and adult at the school. That day, Friday 6th of October, it was just Mary and six students, all girls aged five to 10. The children hailing from three families were playing a game of musical chairs with Mary at the piano, when suddenly the schoolhouse doors flung open. Two men burst into the classroom. One had his face covered by a balaclava, while the other wore dark glasses and a hat. Mary initially thought they were friends of her boyfriend or brothers of one of the students playing a prank. But then her eyes fell on the sawn off rifle that was pointing at her. That's when she knew something terrible was happening. There's no more school today, kids, one of the intruders snarled, while the other placed a ransom note on a desk at the front. The two men, Edwin Eastwood and Robert Boland, both unemployed plasterers, ordered the stunned children and their teacher out of the schoolhouse. On her way out, Mary grabbed a tape recorder, hoping that playing music could help calm the children. The men herded them all into the back of a red delivery van, then sped off. Mary sang to the girls to keep them from panicking. The entire student body of Faraday School had just been abducted. By the time journalist Wayne Grant received the call from the kidnapper, parents had already sounded the alarm to Bendigo police after they had arrived at school for pickup, only to be met by an empty classroom. Eastwood and Boland's ransom note was written in clear capital letters. They demanded $1 million in 20 and $10 notes. The ransom note also read, we are not going to waste anyone's time by making idle threats, so we will cut it short by saying that any attempt to trace us or apprehend us will result in the annihilation of every hostage. That evening, in an emergency press conference, the Premier of Victoria, Dick Hamer, announced that the state government was prepared to pay the ransom. Lindsay Thompson, the state education minister and former teacher himself, was addressed by name in the ransom note and vowed to do everything possible to ensure the hostages safe return to their families. Meanwhile, deep in the remote bushland near the town of Lansfield, 60 kilometers away from the school, Mary Gibbs and her students were huddled together in the back of a van. Mary tried to soothe the children by singing them songs, but she was completely terrified herself, especially when the kidnappers showed her a large trench they had dug promising her that she'd end up buried there if she didn't cooperate. Edwin Eastwood took another car and drove over an hour to Melbourne to call journalist Wayne Grant. He also called Education Minister Lindsay Thompson, but ended up hanging up abruptly, fearing that the call was being traced. Realizing how risky it would be to arrange a meeting at the police headquarters in the city, Eastwood reconsidered their plan and drove back to Lansfield to discuss their next course of action with Robert Boland. It was now late in the night. Boland had allowed the hostages out of the van so they could stretch their legs, but held a flip knife up against them the whole time. Mary Gibbs tried to keep the children calm by pretending they were all on a nature excursion and even had the children make boats out of sticks and leaves. Eastwood returned in the early hours of the morning and locked the hostages back inside the van. The two men then left, telling Mary Gibbs that they were off to collect the ransom. At around 3 a.m., the kidnappers found a phone and contacted police with instructions. Lindsay Thompson was to bring the $1 million to Woodend Post Office, located about 75 kilometers northwest of Melbourne, and he was to go alone. 
police had no idea where Mary Gibbs and the children had been taken, so they had no choice but to follow the kidnappers' instructions. But they put some safeguards in place. Assistant Police Commissioner Bill Crowley, disguised as the minister's chauffeur and armed with a hidden Derringer pistol, drove Lindsay Thompson and his suitcase full of cash, while Assistant Police Commissioner Mick Miller was concealed under a blanket in the back seat with a high-powered rifle. Thompson was told that if there was any trouble, he should duck to give Miller a clean shot. The three men waited in the car all night, intently watching for any sign of the kidnappers. At 5 a.m., an old car drove past slowly before parking nearby. The driver got out and approached them, but he was just a local looking for a friend and had no connection to the kidnappers. Eastwood and Boland never showed up that night. Back in Lansfield, with the kidnappers gone, it was now or never. Mary decided to attempt an escape. First, she rallied up the children and had them all charge the van doors, but the doors were bolted shut from the outside. Mary then tried to kick out one of the panels of the van with her heavy platform boots. She got one of her older students to hold onto a chain on the wall of the van, then placed one hand on the student's shoulder and the other hand on the opposite wall to prop herself up so she could put all her weight behind her kicks. The two oldest girls, both aged 10, also took turns kicking. Finally, after what seemed like hundreds of kicks, the panel gave way and Mary and her students were finally able to climb out. They were free. They stumbled through the bush for a few kilometers, exhausted and disoriented, before coming across a group of rabbit hunters at around 8 a.m. 17 hours later, they were finally safe. An extensive manhunt was immediately set in motion. It turned out that Edwin Eastwood and Robert Boland had lost their nerve and abandoned the entire ransom plan. After realizing their hostages had escaped, they had driven to Bendigo and dumped their weapons and a bag of chains and padlocks into a creek. Hundreds of police, rescue workers, forestry workers, and volunteers searched Bendigo and the surrounding areas over three days. The two men were eventually tracked down and apprehended by heavily armed police officers. Mary Gibbs was asked to positively identify the two men as the kidnappers. In the aftermath of the ordeal, Mary Gibbs and the six girls found themselves in the spotlight, briefly becoming minor celebrities. The children were mostly shielded from the media attention, but Mary was considered a hero. The image of the petite teacher in her heavy platform boots, kicking her way to freedom, became iconic. On the 22nd of January, 1973, Mary Gibbs was honored for her bravery and was awarded a George Medal. Robert Boland was sentenced to 16 years in prison for his part in the kidnapping and was released in November 1983, having served 11 years. Edwin Eastwood changed his plea mid-trial to guilty, claiming that Boland was innocent and that the real accomplice was related to the man Lindsay Thompson spoke to at Woodend. Eastwood received a 15-year prison sentence for his role in the crime. The events in October 1972 resulted in the closure of Faraday School. The students dispersed to other nearby schools, grew up, and went their separate ways, rarely speaking about the kidnapping. 140 kilometers southeast of Melbourne is the quiet dairy township of Wareen, nestled in the rolling hills of the South Gippsland Shire. 20-year-old Rob Hunter, fresh out of teacher's college, had just started his new job as the only teacher at Wareen State School, with only nine students, ranging in age from six to 11. Rob was warmly welcomed into the close-knit community with a barbecue just a few weeks prior. Similar to Mary Gibbs at Faraday School, Rob was the sole adult responsible for the students of Warreen School. Monday, 14th of February, 1977, Valentine's Day, was Rob Hunter's ninth day at his new job. At 10.30 a.m., he dismissed the students for recess as normal, but the children didn't get to play for very long. A gunman walked into the schoolyard his face covered by a balaclava. He ordered the children to get back inside. Rob Hunter was still in the classroom and was startled when the panicked students ran inside, yelling about a man with a gun. At first, Rob thought the children were just playing a game or had seen a rabbit hunter. But then, the masked gunman entered the room, pointing his revolver directly at Rob. Sit down, the gunman barked at the children. Shut up, he ordered Rob. Terrified, they all complied. The gunman, shaking and sweating profusely, explained that he had some demands that needed to be met. 
Rob, realizing that the gunman was extremely nervous, calmly offered to write a check, but the offer was refused. The gunman had brought a 10 meter long chain and several padlocks and restrained Rob first before chaining up all the students as well in one line. Rob Hunter had assumed they were being robbed by some crazed desperate man and had no idea who he was actually dealing with. In December 1976, Edwin Eastwood, the Faraday School kidnapper, had escaped from Geelong Prison. He had been lying low for a few months before deciding to have another go at the exact same crime he had been convicted of in 1972. Eastwood secured the chains to the wall of the classroom so he could retrieve his stolen vehicle, a grey Dodge, which he had parked down the path out of sight. He unchained Rob, but gagged and blindfolded him, and shoved him onto the floor of the passenger side of the car. Eastwood then pushed the nine children into the back of the car, still all chained up. Eastwood left a note in the classroom, gone on a nature study trip, will be back in an hour, a ruse intended to prevent the parents from sounding the alarm immediately. And it worked. Parents didn't start calling the police until 5 p.m. Edwin Eastwood had once again kidnapped the teacher and entire student body of a small rural primary school. A ransom note arrived at Melbourne Sunday Observer newspaper and was again addressed to the education minister, Lindsay Thompson. The name of another nearby primary school, Alambi, had been crossed out and replaced with Warreen, suggesting a change in Eastwood's target for some reason. This time, his demands were bolder. He wanted 7 million US dollars, an assortment of guns, 100 kilograms each of cocaine and heroin, the release of 17 of the state's most dangerous inmates from Pentridge Prison, and a late model car with a full tank of petrol. Eastwood sped off with his hostages, ordering them to keep their heads down. The combination of his erratic driving and the hostages' intense fear caused some of them to vomit. Eastwood repeatedly threatened to shoot anyone who raised their heads or tried to attract the attention of passing vehicles. The remote roads in the mountainous region were winding and narrow, and after about 70 kilometers of driving, Eastwood crashed into a logging truck at a hairpin turn. The Dodge was wrecked, but luckily, nobody was hurt. Eastwood climbed out of the shattered driver's side window, pointing his gun at the two men in the truck, 25-year-old Robin Smith, who was the driver, and his brother. Moments later, another truck rolled around the corner. It was another of Robin Smith's logging trucks. Eastwood ordered the two men out of that truck as well. He now had a total of 14 hostages. Deeming the five men as a greater threat, Eastwood took the chains off the children and used them to restrain the men. He forced them to lay down flat on the side of the road. The children sat on the ground. Because they were stranded in a remote area, several hours had passed before another vehicle came along. A combi van slowly approached the scene. On board were two women in their late 40s, Muriel Depardieu and Julie Edward, who had been enjoying a road trip holiday together. Concerned by the crash, they stopped to offer assistance. However, Eastwood forced the women and all of the hostages into the cramped combi van and set off on a two hour long journey along the mountainous Grand Ridge Road. Throughout the ride, the two women hugged and comforted the children, who had been separated from their teacher the entire time and needed some motherly warmth. The two women had also recognized their kidnapper as the fugitive responsible for the Faraday school kidnapping. It was nightfall by the time they reached an isolated campsite that Eastwood had prepared at an earlier point. The five men were chained around a large tree, while the women continued to console the children inside the van. They were fed tinned ham and chocolate and had to listen to Eastwood boast about the Faraday kidnapping as well as the massive ransom he would soon be receiving. When the news of the worrying kidnapping broke over the car radio, Eastwood was delighted. It was clear he was hungry for media attention and notoriety. Finally, at around 4 a.m., Eastwood fell asleep. Robin Smith, the driver of the first locking truck, was accustomed to handling chains in his daily work. He managed to quietly free himself. He snuck away from the campsite to get help. He ran through the bush for 10 kilometers until he finally came across a farmhouse and was able to call the police. At about 6.45 a.m., Eastwood woke up and realized that one of his hostages was missing. All hell broke loose. He frantically crammed all 15 remaining hostages into the combi van, then sped off. But the police were almost immediately on his tail. 
Multiple police cars were in close pursuit, with officers shooting at the van with high-powered rifles. Eastwood, with his revolver in hand, shot back at the police out the window. Miraculously, none of the hostages were injured. The high-speed chase continued for several kilometers, until finally, the van was forced to stop after its tires had been shot. Eastwood got out of the van, continuing to exchange gunfire with the police, until he was shot in the leg and apprehended, bringing the 21-hour kidnapping ordeal to an end. The hostages, traumatized but physically unharmed, were taken to a nearby hotel to eat and rest, before being driven back home in police cars. Edwin Eastwood pleaded guilty to 25 charges, including 16 counts of kidnapping. On November 8, 1977, he was sentenced to 21 years in prison. The judge ruled that the sentence was to be served concurrently with the remaining balance of the sentence from the Faraday kidnapping, resulting in a total effective sentence of 25 years and 11 months imprisonment. Just two years later, in 1979, Eastwood attempted to escape prison again but his plan was foiled when authorities discovered cuts on the bars of his cell. In April 1981, Eastwood strangled convicted rapist Glenn Davies in the exercise yard of Pentridge Prison. He was charged with murder, but because he had been stabbed 10 times, he was acquitted on the grounds of self-defense. Edwin Eastwood was released in 1993 after denying parole in 1991. He legally changed his name and published a book about his crimes. He currently works as a truck driver. 43 years after the terrifying ordeal, in 2020, Robin Smith, the man who risked his life and ran for 10 kilometers to get help, was honored with the Australian Bravery Award. Robin, a humble and soft-spoken man, doesn't consider himself to be a hero, but Rob Hunter says there is no doubt that he saved all of their lives that day a sentiment echoed by the other hostages involved. Rob continued teaching for 40 years before retiring. In 2018, he published a book called Day 9 at Warreen, which details the events of that day, and now runs seminars about overcoming trauma.